Hungrybox has had a tumultuous career as a top player in Melee. In the Melee Revival era, Hungrybox was a regular runner-up. He was always a step or two behind Mango and Armada, who were the people who were keeping him out of winning a tournament. When he did win big, he did it with a very controversial character that made him kind of a villain in the Melee community. But that's something most of us know about. We all know about Hungrybox and his rise to the top, including the controversy that came with it. The story of Hungrybox as a Melee god is a well-known and a well-told one. But there is a much lesser known story about Hungrybox's career. It's the story of how Hungrybox became more than just a player. It's about how he became a commentator, an organizer, and one of the best Smash streamers alive, and how he overcame his demons in the process. But before we get started, I'd like for you guys to check out ProGuides.com, where we have on-demand coaching through Instapro to help you get the most out of the time you're putting into Ultimate. Our new Pro Pass grants you free passes to Instapro, along with a plethora of exclusive content all posted daily. Click the link in the description below to learn more about ProGuides. This is the story of Hungrybox's journey through Smash Ultimate. And it's one that really begins 12 years ago, on January 31st, 2008, with the release of Super Smash Bros. Brawl. By 2008, it had been nearly seven years since the release of Super Smash Bros. Melee, so Smash was overdue for a new title. However, Melee was going to be a tough act to follow. After all, Melee has insane staying power, surviving and even growing as an esport nearly two decades after its release. In just a few months, it was clear that Brawl was no Melee 2.0. Melee was made on an incredibly tight release schedule, just two years after Smash 64. The result was a game that lacked polish in many ways that would make it competitively beautiful. Melee's success has brought Sakurai more time and resources to apply to Brawl, and Sakurai used it to make sure another Melee wouldn't happen. The result was a new Smash game with the bones of the old Smash titles, but a completely different style. This would be crucial, as Smash titles were similar enough to have layover, but different enough that many Melee players would stick with Melee. The result was that Smash roughly stayed as one community, with the fault line running down the middle. For most of his career, Hungrybox fell to the Melee side of things and for a pretty good reason. Jigglypuff. At this point, Hungrybox is basically synonymous with Jigglypuff. And the new games didn't just nerf Puff, they made her a shell of herself. Puff ranked among the absolute worst characters in Brawl and Smash 4. In Ultimate, she makes it on the mid-tier list sometimes, but still floats around the low-tier part. The new games invalidated the strengths that made Puff great in Melee. If you watch Hungrybox in Tournament, you know that Melee Puff is high risk, high reward. Melee Puff can reverse a lead with one read. Melee Puff can close a set with one throw, or even one falling up air. And Melee Puff dies early on any stage that's not named Dreamland. In Brawl, Puff had clear character nerfs, but also wider meta nerfs. Safer recoveries meant Puff's edge guarding didn't matter as much. Less combos meant Puff had way less ways to land rest. In Meta Knight, the most used character at the highest level was simply the better floating ball of death. Puff had totally been hollowed out. So Hungrybox mostly stuck to a mix of Melee and Project M during the Brawl days. And when he would play Brawl, he would often pick DDD, because DDD had a chain grab that was every bit as effective as it was Goofy. When Smash 4 came out, Puff's luck wasn't any better. It might have been even worse. First thing that you guys will notice, there is only one character in Loki, and that is Jigglypuff. Hungrybox's competitive luck was a good deal worse too. But Smash 4 would be important for Hungrybox, not just as a competitor. In 2018, Vasef, the TO for Frostbite tournaments, asked Hungrybox to do some commentary. It was mostly a cool, fun way to spice up the broadcast. Get the best Melee player and one of the best Smash players ever to commentate for a game where he's just another low-tier hero. It turned out to be a game changer for the number one player's career. Hungrybox's Smash 4 commentary wasn't just plain good. The up air brings him down into his loving hands. Are you in good hands? It was funny, energetic, and interesting. But there was more to it than quality. By stepping up to the mic, Hungrybox was providing a non-judgmental link between the two sides of the community. He wasn't just commentating Smash 4, he was doing it without condensation and with genuine excitement. For the new game side of the Smash community, this was a huge breath of fresh air because the Melee side of the Smash community often talked down to the new side of Smash. Before any of this gets too controversial, a lot of times, it wasn't meant to be mean. Melee players didn't hate the new part of the Smash community. On the contrary, a lot of players like Mewtwo King made huge inroads into both sides of Smash. A lot of Melee players just didn't like Nintendo's vision of Smash. Nintendo didn't want Smash to look like Melee. They didn't want a game that had a high skill floor, even if it meant the game had an even higher skill ceiling. They wanted to make a truly approachable fighting game, and they turned the new Smash games away from Melee to do that. So some Melee players disliked the new games and voiced that opinion. Things got worse when Nintendo outright attacked Melee. Just after the Melee community fundraised their way into EVO, Nintendo wanted Melee completely shut out. Only a huge public backlash made Nintendo relent. The antagonistic moments between Melee and Nintendo changed the dynamic. It turned from, eh, I don't like the new games that much, into a deeper argument about Smash as an esport. 
Some parts of the Melee community see the new Smash as babyfied, Nintendo's sellout version of their game, the less competitive, less good games that only exist because Nintendo can't handle how cool Melee is. They snap at the new Smash community sometimes in order to express their visions of Smash, and sometimes because they really like to hurt Nintendo's feelings, but Nintendo's probably not crying about releasing the best-selling fighting game of all time. And some parts of the new Smash community see Melee as snobby elitists who can't get the times and scare away the sponsors, who clings to an old game because they can't get that not everyone wants to grind for hours a day just to be decent. They snap back at the Melee crowd sometimes defaming their scene, and sometimes because of old wounds that hurt. Truthfully, most people in Smash are fine with each other, but those loud voices make both sides look more wary of one another. And that's why Hungerbox's commentary was such a big success. It was the best Melee player validating a new Smash game with no asterisks. No need to interject that Melee's cooler, just sincere excitement about the game. Yeah, bring it in, y'all. Smash 4 is so sick! It also meant that HBox had a fresh start in a community that didn't care much about Melee baggage. That meant the Smash 4 community acknowledged HBox's talents in that same way, with no asterisks. To understand just why that matters so much, we have to dig into one of the messiest areas of professional Smash, reputation. It's important to understand that many of Smash's competitors literally grow up in the scene. If you watched our MKLeo doc, you know that he won his first tournament at 8 years old. If you watched the world famous Smash doc, you've seen real life footage of Baby Hungrybox. In the process of growing up, most of us make mistakes, we handle conflict poorly, we let our egos talk us into treating others poorly, and we overreact and lash out unnecessarily. Hungrybox made some mistakes, and he earned a bad reputation. We won't go into great detail about the specifics honestly, but it's mostly mundane dick moves. Like Hbox pushing puffs to avoid practicing with high level foxes, or refusing an autograph request from a young kid, or being disrespectful and friendlies with fans. Normally, communities can move past these petty offenses. The problem was Hbox had a perfect storm of reputation issues. He also had a lot of ego, which led to him acting self-important or arrogant at times. You ever have everything you ever wanted? And then when you finally have it, you're like, now what? Nah. And he's also an emotional player, which leads to emotional responses like this. Yeah! Or this. <laughs> or this. <laughs> to top it all off, he started winning a lot. So his personality, his emotion, his ego all took the spotlight over and over. On top of all that, he won to the style a lot of diehard fans did not like. And so his moves regularly got overanalyzed. Not his melee moves, his literal moves, like checking his watch. In turn, Hbox responded in his emotional, self-serious way. While a good part of the community accepted this and moved on, another chunk of the community saw his emotional personality and occasional soapboxing as reasons to double down. Throughout 2017, 2018, and half of 2019, Melee repeated this awful cycle that generally went down like this. Hbox wins a lot, gets hated on, and gets tilted. The Hbox haters get annoyed of Hbox's tilt. Hbox gets defensive. The wider audience comes down on Hbox's haters. The haters get defensive and bring back up Hbox's checkered past. Then everyone forgets about it until it happens again six months later. Meanwhile, Hbox is a real flesh and blood person caught in a cycle of love and hate. Love Hbox for his skill, emotion, and professionalism. Hate Hbox for his main, his ego, and his past. In the tumble and twirl of mixed signals, it would be harder for anyone to express who they really are. Hbox wasn't a complete stranger in his own scene, but he was distant, and he couldn't show his talents as a commentator, organizer, and streamer. I'm actually not entirely sure what to say because I feel like I know Hungerbox more than I know Juan. It might be hard to believe that the audience and community could do so much to a player's career, but to prove it, you just have to look at Hbox's first attempt to go full-time in esports. In October 2016, Hungrybox went full-time in esports for the first time, establishing a stream schedule and trying to make more content. However, the attempt fell flat as he returned to an engineering job in 2017. At that time, the cycle of love and hate was in full motion and Hbox was fully caught up in it. Uh, I guess views of me are very polarizing. And people say that's, you know, good for him how he, how, I, I don't know how he manages it. He, se he seems to deal with it pretty well. Um, fun fact, I don't. Hbox had to parse out genuine ego and character issues from a giant pile of hate complaints that were never going to be helpful. That process made it hard to stream because it made him doubtful about deep parts of himself. You start second guessing your own personality, Hbox said in an interview with Zane Ipengu Basali and HTC. And then you look at all this and you're like, damn, maybe I actually don't really know who I am or I don't really know what I've become and maybe I let my ego get the best of me. 
This is why Frostbite 2018 and 2018 as a whole was a huge deal for HBox. By stepping into a new community where there was much less baggage, he could be more authentic. Live commentating and I'm really happy I got to do it. And the Smash 4 community would appreciate him as well. Someone said that you're leaving them uh, rock solid. Still, Smash 4 would be only the first step. HBox would really come into his own with the release of Ultimate. And he'd show himself as not only a competitor, but a commentator, organizer, and streamer. He'd finally have a fully positive role in the Smash community. Not many people know it, but Hungrybox has long been more than a competitor. When Hungrybox was younger, he'd regularly organize tournaments at his mom's house with his old Florida crew. What are the odds? These tournaments eventually branched out into the local area. He also ran a dodgeball club while working as an engineer and establishing himself as the best melee player. He'd been looking at commentating for a while too. In an interview with Austin Plythe Ryan and Team Liquid, he said he always had the idea that he wanted to do broadcasting, especially in college. HBox had tried to break into Melee commentary, but again, the problem was reputation. In the same interview, Hungrybox admitted being the one that people are like, oh god, not this guy again, has definitely tarnished his Melee commentary. But in the new Smash community, Hungrybox wasn't some dire threat that you couldn't banter with, so he got to express the natural excitement and emotion that Smash brought him, and he got to become one of Ultimate's most hype. most humorous. No matter the character or the matchup, he is Mexican, he is the prodigy, <laughs> he is winning the first game. And most beloved commentators. In the Ultimate Era, Hungrybox not only got on the mic for Frostbite, but for Smash Conference United, Thunder Smash, CEO, and Smash and Splash. At the same time as being Melee's top competitor, he was also one of Ultimate's top commentators. It's a Smash crossover we rarely get to see, and it was a healing one for HBox. Talking with Team Liquid's Hungrybox said, Overall, I haven't enjoyed being in the community this much in a really long time, and a lot of that is because of Ultimate. It wasn't just commentary either. The Ultimate community has also embraced Hungrybox's tournaments and streams. Hungrybox's own tournament series, Overlords of Orlando, has become a strong regional in Florida. Hungrybox is even hosting a $10,000 net play tournament with starting running back LeVon Bell, which got over 3,500 entrants in less than a day. In Ultimate, Hungrybox finally found a space where he could be more than the villain. This time, he could actually be a streamer. On top of commentary and TOing, HBox has found crazy success as a streamer. He went full-time in esports again in June 2019, and this time he was doing it with a supportive community and as a much more mature person. He was doing it as a player who had relaxed his ego and dropped into a more jovial, off-the-cut persona. Oh, I can do that. To see what we mean, take a snippet of HBox defending a melee technique called wobbling at Summit, where he got some flack for being preachy. Time I see is one a super national. Oh, oh wait. Now, tell me about it. I think I can't think of one actually. I know. It's weird that we want to ban the eighth best character's number one I tool to know. actually win. Now, watch him defend the same technique on stream. It's like getting banned from prom for being too ugly. <laughs> Gradually, HBox got the space and comfort to play on his own persona. The fresh start and newfound popularity let him cut loose a bit and poke fun at himself without fear of being misread. Just like HBox had a slow growth into being the best melee player, he also had a slow growth into being one of Smash's most entertaining streamers. <laughs> Off the air dodge? And that's a hard task. Streaming looks effortless, but only because it's supposed to be. Streamers are expected to run giveaways, monitor subscribers, shout out sponsors, watch chat, and build a brand all while making the game look easy. And HBox has done all of that while leveraging the talents he now feels confident in. He commentates crazy CPU battles to make giveaways for. He walks his audience through the intensity of a tournament run. He pops off like a madman and he shows gratitude every step of the way. It's my way of showing thank you to you guys. Because the successful stream, the wide acceptance, none of that came easy. More than just overcoming his bracket demons, it took overcoming life demons. It took stepping into new parts of the Smash community, bridging old divides, overcoming hate and ego, and reconciling with the past. All of that has trickled back into the melee scene too. After Pound 2019, when someone in the audience threw a crab at HBox, the Smash community woke up to how bad player hate can get. The stream, the new game, and a crab all combined together to give HBox a new lease on life in the world of Smash. It's not the flashiest story, it doesn't take place in any bracket, but it's an interesting one, and a reminder that Smash is more than just a game, or even an esport, it's a community. And it takes more than working on your game to find your place, it takes working on yourself and your scene. 13 years into my Smash career, which at this point is well over half of my life, uh, I'm not going anywhere. And I'm hoping that the scene continues to grow as much as it can. And I'm hoping that all of you, at the next tournament, after all this 
chaos so a virus passes after all this madness is over and after we can finally start going and stepping foot into the same venue at the same time for the first time in months. I hope that you cheer as loudly as possible for your favorite opponent and that you show respect to everyone, even if you don't want to cheer for them. Because I think that's what Smash is all about. And that's why we're still here. And we'll be here for another 100 years. <laughs> don't forget to subscribe to Pro Guides and click the bell so you never miss out on the next upload.